Mark Settle, and today I'm excited to be spending some time with Creasy Trivasani. Uh, Creasy has had a long and illustrious career as a Chief Information Security Officer. And uh, before I let her make a few introductory remarks about her background, uh, the topic today is going to be how you build a security culture. Now, this has been a, a topic of uh, angst for me for a long time. I've been in a lot of companies in, that had very well-organized and planned and executed security programs. But as far as people's individual behaviors and you know, beliefs and values, um, weren't always necessarily aligned with ensuring or, or uh, enforcing the security of the organization. So I think it's a big leap to go from you know, the bare bones of a program to really instill across the entire enterprise and even within the entire IT group, the importance of security. So knowing that you've dealt with this for many years, we're not going to say exactly how many years. Uh, uh, um, give us a little bit of background. I know most recently you've, you've had a long tenure at the American Red Cross. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the security issues you encountered there. Sure. I, um, my first CISO position was I was the Chief Information Security Officer for the George Washington University. And that was in 2000. And I was the first one there. And you can imagine the issues that uh, you can face as the first time CISO in an organization where they've never had a CISO, where the first issue is, all right, I want to put passwords. We want to put passwords on everyone's email. And that was a uh, issue where, all right, we got to talk about firing this new girl who wants us to put passwords on to growing a culture where it was a world-class security program integrated with the researchers and that side with internships. So at the American Red Cross, fast forward 10 years, they already had a security program established. It was how do you keep modernizing it? And that is so critical. How do you move forward? How do you collaborate in an organization like a American Red Cross where you have hundreds of thousands of volunteers that you have to burst up in an emergency situation and be able to get them access, focus on that mission, and balance the security needs and the privacy of the data that people entrust you with? I mean, it is a life-saving mission. So making sure that that mission is not compromised in the name of security, that security supports it in all facets is critical. So, I mean, this is obvious, but you know, when I think about a culture, any kind of a cultural um, value or phenomenon, um, communication is so critical. And in the case of security, you know, education as well, educating people about both, you know, the real threat actors, the real ways in which, you know, they think about invading or or uh, taking over part of your turf you know and what some of the consequences can be as well i think many people feel that if there was a security problem that will only affect some other part of the organization or i don't really have like a personal stake in it and having been through several incidents of my own which have completely disrupted our strategic plans for the rest of the year and totally distracted you know senior management um the, the effects can be pretty profound and they can ripple across the entire organization so, so that whole communication process is really like, you know, I don't know, the first commandment or the first amendment in terms of enlisting both the hearts, you know, not just the minds, but the hearts of the people in the organization. So any lessons learned on your part about, you know, what constitutes effective communication? Sure. First, the communication needs to be meaningful. Right. And uh, when I say meaningful, it depends on who your audience is. So I like to tell a story. So I'm going to tell a little story uh, that I call printers running amok. So this is when I was a young CISO. And every week, you know, I have this uh, security report where I'm reporting, here's the risk. And Every week I'm reporting, we have a printer issue. Now everybody at that time had unsecure printer issues, right? So um, I keep repeating this. There's an issue, there's an issue, there's an issue. We need to do something about the printers. So one day we all come in and someone has pulled a prank and has sent out prints of Osama bin Laden on printers across the organization. No one wants to walk in with their morning coffee to that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so all of a sudden, it's, what's happening? Why, why is this happening to the printers? People are freaking out. 
and I'm talking to my boss, the CIO and the CTO. And I'm like, I've been telling you this for the last five weeks. And they're like, you didn't tell me hard enough. And at the time I was, I was kind of mad. I'm like, what do you mean I didn't tell you hard enough? They were absolutely right. I didn't because I wasn't communicating in a way that was meaningful to them. That made sense to them. I was looking at risk every day the way I look at risk. And I needed to present it in a way that made sense. So what did we do? Our engineers put a list together of here's a random list of pages of printers out there, IP addresses. Go up and talk to the CIO and said, all right, hey, just give us a couple minutes. Take a look at this list. Pick an IP address, any IP address on that list. Type it in. He randomly selects one, puts it in there. Next thing, he's like, okay, it's asking me for a password. We're like, well, what do you think the password is? He's like, well, you're always telling me don't put in like one, two, three. I'm like, try that. He tries one, two, three. It doesn't work. I'm like, well, what else would you think? He said, okay, I'm password. So he puts in password because he's heard this before from us. Boom, he's in. And we said, congratulations, you've just hacked your first printer. All of a sudden, he understood how easy it was to do. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. And we can have this prank repeatedly until we fix the problem and contain the situation. So making sure that the risk is not only understood, but it's personal to that audience. Because if you can't make them care about it, they're not going to. Totally true. You know, and I don't want to get off into the box canyon of passwords. <laughs> we probably talk about passwords for like an hour. But it is remarkable how much people resist, you know, longer and more complex passwords. And yet the research categorically shows, definitively shows, that just a slightly longer and more complex password you know, just becomes that much harder to break. And so the, the bad guys, they'll find easy stuff, right? So if you're just willing to have eight characters or 12 characters and throw in a couple of variations in the theme, it makes a world of difference. Okay, yeah. that was a personal, let's not, let's not get too deep on that one. Um, now, my, my next kind of saw that I'm going to get out here and, and grind down for a bit is the importance, again, of, of enlisting everybody in, in the security crusade, right, in the security culture. And I always think it's remarkably naive and kind of laughable that large companies with thousands of employees can think that a small team of security professionals, you know, buried in the bowels of the organization, can protect everybody from everything. And I think most IT professionals would agree with that. But unfortunately, a lot of IT organizations do exactly the same thing, you know, within the 300 person IT group or 500 person IT group or pick a number, there's a very small number, 20, maybe, maybe fewer, that are the security folks, right? And they're gonna like take care of the rest of IT. And I'd like to pretend that, you know, their IT colleagues are, you know, wholly behind their efforts. But as you well know, the minute you go and ask somebody to help with an incident or change a process or insert a new tool into their tech stack, you know, you know, they act like they've never even seen you before. You know, I mean, they find every reason to procrastinate and delay. So building alliances, not just with other departments, but almost like within your own organization to get them to take security seriously, I think is one of the biggest challenges that, that security professionals face. So how do you think about building those alliances when you've got so many different players with so many other objectives? I think those un alliances and unlikely places is a way to help w overcome that. You know, early in my career, I worked I, with auditors and uh, with the legal counsel and folks in the security field that I would talk to, they're like, why are you talking to them about what's going on in security? I'm like, I need them to be my partner. And now it's very common that people use partnerships that might have been unlikely at one time, uh, like an audit and legal as regular interactions. So when I say unlikely places now, really I think outside the box and I'm gonna have to tell a story and I'll call it analytical street fighting in a dress. So, I grew up in a tough neighborhood. 
So my dad taught us maximum damage, minimal effort if you're in a dangerous situation. So as I'm growing up, I, you know, decide I want to take it to the next level and I want to learn, you know, some self-defense. What do they teach women my age? Self-defense. And I go and the, they're telling me, number one, run. I'm like, number one, I ain't run, I'm running nobody, right? <laughs> so if you are trying to tell me that my defensive strategy is to run, I will fail every time. And I have now lost hope. So I need a strategy that works for me. I had a friend, ex-military, pretty, pretty cool guy. And I heard, overheard him saying he was teaching a class called analytical street fighting. I said, where and when I'm there. And he's like, what are you talking about, crazy? This is, you know, pretty military. It's all guys. You're going to be the only woman there. I'm like, I don't care. I will follow you there unless you tell me where it is. So I show up and I show up in, with my coffee and my little purse. I, I show up like I show up. And these guys are, you know, all kung fu fighting, looking like ninjas, right? And they look over at me and I'm like, hi, I'm here to join the class. And there is laughter, okay? And I'm like, but gentlemen, this is analytical street fighting. I'm not here to learn how to fight the way you fight. I'm here to learn how to defend myself with the weapons that I have. So on a daily basis, if I can defend myself against badasses like you, then the average guy, he better watch out because I like my coffee extra hot and my purse also doubles as brass knuckles. So look at the differences that you can bring to the table and what you can teach each other. And you can have a lot of fun creating new things. Interesting. And yeah, I think you do have to find creative ways of enlisting other people's help. I mean, you can't just announce we're going to have a seminar, you know, a lunch bag seminar and the local FBI agent's going to come in and tell us all about, you know, X, Y, or Z. You can have the greatest, you know, lunch spread laid out to attract mm -hmm. people to come in for the, the freebies, but um, that's that's not, they're gonna remember whatever they learned in that for probably about 30 minutes and then just kind of go back to the, the world that they know best. Mm -hmm. So the, then the last, you know, behavior um, that I wanted to talk to you about <laughs> was, was decisive action. And, you know, with any kind of cultural value again, there are typically a couple of moments in the course of, a year or a, maybe a quarter where it, the folks on, on, that are listening to us that are in leadership roles, you know, this is where you really kind of demonstrate and validate the, these cultural values that we're talking about, right? Um, in many cases, they're few and far between. And it, it's, it's a shame to let one slip by, you know, when you have the opportunity to actually through an action, um, you know, point out that this is important. One of the, my favorite, Proverbs that I learned from a colleague several years ago <laughs> he used to say, anything that interests my boss fascinates me. Right? Very nice. So whenever his boss would express interest or take action, you know, people, the cues in the rest of the organization are so great. They're subliminal almost. They're subconscious. Mm -hmm. People don't always really think about that. But if you can kind of, if, when they manifest themselves in the form of an actual action, um, that people can point to and say, well, I guess they really are serious about this. You know, mm -hmm. they actually, they punished somebody or they bought something or, you know, they're going to train us on in some new way. You know, that all sends the message that uh, um, this isn't just, just you know, being politically correct and talking about the things that we're supposed to, um, but that it's real and, and the company is living the, the reality of the, uh, you know, the security values that they're, they're promoting. So, so maybe you could tell a story or two about um, where you've seen decisive action taken and, and the messages that it sent. Well, yeah, absolutely. So think about if you have a collaboration, what do you have in common? Hopefully you have a common mission or a goal, okay, that you all believe in that you can work towards. And if you don't, create one. So when I was a kid, collaboration with my sisters usually meant at the end that there would be a treat. 
So we're going to call this the Pop-Tart incident. Okay. So we have a common mission. Once in a blue moon, we get Pop-Tarts. And there are requirements to get to that mission. You have to clean your room. You have to clean the bathroom. You have to do your homework. There are things that have to be done to get that mission done. You work together, you get everything done because at the end of it, you know the reward is sweet and you all want it. You have that mission. We go to bed that night dreaming of Pop-Tarts. I'm so excited I can't sleep. I see my sister, and I'm the youngest, walk by, and I'm like, hmm. And I count. She's walked by back and forth six times. I'm like, no, oh, I wonder what the heck she's doing. I wake up the next morning to chaos. My sister is sick because she has slept walk back and forth and ate every single Pop-Tart in the box, all six, and she is totally sick. And I'm like, I was wondering what you were doing walking back and forth all night. All of a sudden, all the anger at my sister who had been the one to eat the Pop-Tarts has been directed at me. Because as part of this collaboration, I saw something was afoot and I did nothing. I did nothing about it. So now I've turned into the person who has failed the mission and there are outliers to the failure of that mission as well because now my sister's mad at me that she doesn't feel good and she didn't ever get to enjoy the Pop-Tarts but she still got all the calories. So what are those intrinsic after effects of not taking action? So if you're in a collaboration, your commitment to each other is when you see something, say something. I mean, it's so easy to sort of passively comply with procedures or do, you know, do what's right, but it's, it's so different to proactively identify new liabilities or um, you know, report things that seem somewhat anomalous or suspicious. Everybody's busy. Some of these kind of activities are not people's number one job, number two job, number three job. Um, but again, when security is sort of a commonly held value throughout the whole organization, those more proactive kind of activities just take place matter of course, right? So, yeah. so people and, and if you do a security collaboration with other organizations, say uh, we did a collaboration between GW, uh, American University, and Georgetown University, where it was a a collaboration on the cybersecurity level where it was a NATO of sorts. If one university got attacked, the other two helped respond. And when you're looking at those unusual collaborations, you know, nonprofits, how can you work together to get the common mission and goal? We were universities, we needed to make sure we didn't have the money for, say, a forensics analyst information warfare lab, but the other university did. What are those tools that you can use together to create common value sets and really produce? So, you know, I think uh, it's certainly a lot of podcasts and conversations and blogs these days about the COVID crisis and the, the effect that it's had. I've actually started to talk to some other CIOs about their budgeting priorities during the second half of the year, presuming that we'll start going back into offices and you know, operations will resume something closer to kind of normalcy or what we've been used to in the past. And I've, I've asked them like, where do you, what kind of investments, what are your top two or three spending priorities as you get back to the post COVID crisis world? And uh, almost uniformly, I think security is at the top of everybody's list. Even, even organizations that thought they had done all the right things, have all the right safeguards, have the best processes, et cetera, the whole work from home phenomena um, and the you know widespread use of personal devices, personal applications, you know it's just opened up a whole different kind of world um, mm -hmm. to think about and to worry about. Uh, so I, I guess in closing, I don't know if you'd have any coaching for people um, sure. things to think about when they when they look at September first and they're back there thinking about now what are my what are my budget priorities for next year? Or what are the first one or two things that I ought to be chasing? Well, I'll tell you some of the great things that the American Red Cross did to prepare for a pandemic like this. Years ago, we closed down our brick and mortar offices for IT, right? 
for cost savings and were able to have a remote workforce. So already in place, we had a stable remote workforce who was used to the requirements, the pressures of working from home. Uh, so when you're looking at your security budgets, if you don't have like a virtual workplace already set up, two-factor authentication, how are you going to handle uh, employee devices, as well as are there going to be stipends? How are you going to handle the cost-benefit analysis? Because that's really key. So if you have people out there who have experience in digital leadership, get them. That's my advice. Oh, and always have a backup. <laughs> I thought you were going to bring brass knuckles out again. That, you know, you're going to intimidate me with those. Okay. <laughs> so much for your time, and thank you for sharing some of these very interesting experiences that you've had.